Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. I'm Amy Miller, the Federal Grant Administrator at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, or OPR. OPR is the state's comprehensive planning agency, and one of our many responsibilities is to provide resources and assistance on all aspects of federal grants. We serve as the state's single point of contact for the intergovernmental review of federal programs under the Executive Order, or EO 12372, and we hold trainings like this one to encourage and improve the ability of people and organizations in California to pursue and manage federal grants. You can find many more resources like this at the OPR website under the link for federal grants. There you'll find the link for the online portal to comply with the EO12372 process, along with a page full of federal grant resources like other trainings, reports, websites, and many other tools. Both the slides and the recording from this webinar will be posted here on this page as well under the trainings tab. And one of the best ways to learn more about federal grants is to sign up for the federal grants update e-list, which you can also do here on this page. This is a weekly email newsletter that highlights the new grant opportunities, federal funding news, and training events. And now before I turn things over to our presenter, I'd like to share a short disclaimer that the following presentation does not constitute legal advice and does not necessarily represent the views or endorsement of OPR, but is provided as a service to the grants community. And with that, I'd like to hand things off to our presenter, Julie Asel from Asel Grant Services. Julie is the president and CEO of ASIL Grant Services, a nationally recognized leader in grant seeking, management, and training. She's the past president of the Grant Professionals Certification Institute and is a Grant Professional Association approved trainer. We're thrilled to have her here with us today. And so with that, I'll turn things over to Julie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Building Partnerships for Federal Grant Success. As Amy said, my name is Julie Asel, um, the President and CEO of Asel Grant Services. We are federal grant experts. We write proposals, help clients implement projects, and write and manage grants for probably 75 to 100 federal grants a year. We do that for institutions of higher education, nonprofits, school districts, healthcare systems, and behavioral health centers. Today's webinar will focus on how to build partnerships with the intent of applying for a federal grant, and then how to involve partners in federal, the kind of the federal grant development process. Now, the two most common reasons to include partners in a federal grant are, one, because the grant requires you to, or two, because an organization is interested in a grant opportunity which they only currently provide maybe some of the required services, or their services only produce some of the required outcomes. But the reality is, in many communities, federal funding would still be a strong investment in the services that help individuals in need, and organizations really need to learn how to find each other and partner effectively to bring these resources to their communities. So today's webinar is designed to help you grow in your knowledge of federal grants so you're as comfortable as possible when the time comes for you to apply for a federal grant in partnership with another organization. So today we're going to start by stepping through how to find partnerships, how to build relationships, how to involve partners in program design and proposal creation, and then how to accurately maybe reflect your partnership in the grant budget. Each of our webinar components today are aligned to the competencies and skills of the Grant Professional Certification Institute, who administers the Grant Professional Certified, or GPC for short. The GPC is the only nationally accredited credential for grant professionals. This credential is accredited by the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, and ASO Grant Services has more credentialed grant professionals than any other credential professional grant services firm in the country, which allows us to provide unparalleled services and support to organizations both large and small. Now, all of our trainings have been approved for education points by the Grant Professionals Certification Institute through their accepted education program. Participants in today's session can earn one education point for this 60-minute training. 
these education points are applicable toward acquiring your GPC credential or maintaining your GPC. To learn more, I encourage you to go to www.grantcredential.org. Today's training has also been approved by CFRE International for similar, similar education points towards CFRE's recertification with alignment to its CFRE domains and tasks. Now, we're gonna present, I'm gonna present a lot of information today, but I want to make sure that it is as responsive to where you are as an organization and as, as an individual as possible. So as we go through, feel free to drop questions in either the question uh, portion of uh, WebEx or in the chat, if you're interested in having everyone be able to see it. Now, how many of you have ever looked at a great grant opportunity only to realize that you can't be the applicant? Sometimes I feel like that's happening more and more for the organizations with whom I work, especially with some of the recent stimulus dollars, which have been passed down through local and regional municipalities. But today I wanna to talk with you about how to not let those opportunities pass your organization and your community by. So first I wanna say the federal government loves partnerships. They like to see their funding help a community and not just a single agency. And our organization has been contacted by several different types of community conveners to help applications which bring together collaborators and consortia to address needs identified in particular grants. Sometimes we start with a grant application and its requirements for a partnership, and sometimes we start with a single organization in a community who realizes that while a grant is perfect for some of the services they provide, these services are only part of what the grant requires. Now, some organizations are gonna will go down the road of mission creep and start a whole program just to get federal grant funding. But in reality, your federal grant application would be much more competitive if you simply partner with other organizations in your community that provide the other services. So the first step is understanding other organizations in your community. Here are some ideas of where you can start. Some communities have a local nonprofit association, which provides a place for nonprofits or other organizations to meet and network. Other communities have local United Ways or foundations who are familiar with the landscape in a geographic region. Then there may be task forces or other subject specific groups or gatherings where staff from agencies, both leadership and direct line staff can discuss who they serve, what services they offer, and what data they collect, and what outcomes they're able to achieve. Other common partnerships include your local community college, your university, your school district, maybe your health and behavioral health care institutions, maybe libraries and cultural organizations, or your city or county government. You might even check with your chamber of commerce or other local business associations as some nonprofit CEOs have roundtable gatherings formed through association that way. Now, if nothing like that exists, it might seem silly, but I've actually tried to Google the services that I'm looking for in my community uh, before to see what organizations come up. I look for organizations who provide similar services, but different populations or maybe geographic regions. And I also look at organizations who provide a service similar, um, but uh, to, excuse me, provide a similar population or geographic region, but then they provide the different services. Then I try to take a look, well, how big is the organization? And just a caveat here, bigger is not always better. Sometimes small organizations are more nimble and frankly, easier to partner with. I check the size of their budget. Maybe I look them up in 990, in Candid's GuideStar, or if they're a public entity, again, I just Google them. Organizations which have at least a million dollars in revenue are more likely to have the staffing, policies, and procedures to handle federal grant funding. But again, you might want to check with smaller organizations who might just be looking for federal grant funding to expand their operations. In fact, 
I recently submitted a $97 million grant, which involved providing $25 million to an organization which was well respected nationally, but prior to that point, completely volunteer run. The key in all of these situations is that partner organizations really kind of have to have three minimum things. One, the ability to track information on their services. Two, the ability to ethically manage grant funds. And three, the ability to collect data about the participants. Now, some organizations might not have all of these abilities at the time you reach out to them, but they need to be willing to learn about the requirements, accept the responsibilities, and start moving toward a plan that allows them to implement these core competencies. In a perfect world, they would have the ability to contribute data to the needs of the population to strengthen your need section of a grant, and they would ideally provide data on how many people they've served, with what services to achieve what outcomes, similar to what the grant is requiring. But the reality is, there are many different kinds of partnerships. So we're gonna start out by defining partnerships and then talking about how to build relationships with these other organizations. Now here is a partnership continuum chart. Technically, there's a column to the left um, of networking that's not on this chart that's called immering. Immering is basically the complete silo approach. Program activities are delivered with absolutely no input or exchange of ideas with other institutions. Think of how maybe Burger King sells burgers on one side of the road and McDonald's is on the other. But notice how the word partnering is actually not listed on this slide. Partnership is a continuum. All of these columns are partnering, where a stakeholder relationship falls along this continuum really depends upon the formality, the characteristics, and the extent to which resources are shared. And in no way are any of these columns better than one another either. What's important is that the stakeholders, in, the stakeholder organizations, engage with each other in a way that's agreed upon by all involved parties. Now, network, networking is the next column, and it is just as it sounds, right? Stakeholders are sharing information, but not really much more than that. Everyone at a networking event might have a different agenda. They, um, they all know the value of meeting people, and a common event provides that opportunity. Everyone there might also like beverages and cheese platters too. When you attend a networking event, participants swap elevator speeches and business cards, and then everyone goes home with a few new names for their mailing list. The example I would give you is where, let's say a hospital asks a, a YMCA to put flyers out on their kiosk. If the hospital is not tracking referral sources, I would say, that's networking. If the Y happens to do it, great. It may lead to some referrals. However, if they forget, I'm hunching that let's say the, the whole weight loss program at the hospital, it's not gonna fall apart. Moving to the right, the next option is coordination. This is where stakeholders compare their respective activities and they may even alter them a little bit for a mutual benefit. There's a small amount of trust involved here, as each stakeholder hopes the others will do what they say they will do and hopes they will hold up their end of the bargain if you hold up yours. So here's an example, right? Let's say there's a church and a boys and girls club in the same neighborhood, and they both want to hold a safe family Halloween event, and they just found out about the other's event. Neither wants to cancel, they, so they had a meeting and they decided that the church will run their event from 4 to 6 p.m. and the Boys and Girls Club will hold theirs from six, uh, from 4 to 6 and then 6 to 8. Um, this means that neither agency must cancel their event, but they just have to adjust it a bit, a bit. The community wins as there will now be four hours from youth in the neighborhood to enjoy safe and family-friendly programming but there won't necessarily be any actual engagement between the church and the Boys and Girls Club 
once the staggered activities are agreed upon. The third one is cooperation. This means that stakeholders are not just comparing schedules about respective activities, but they're sharing resources to conduct common activities or achieve a common purpose. For example, um, let's say I ran a transitional housing program that serves families that are working towards self-sufficiency. However, some of the neighbors are starting to complain about unsupervised youth getting into trouble because they have nothing to do. I've heard that there's a new nonprofit organization in the community that provides tutoring. So call the nonprofit and I ask for a meeting with the executive director and learn that they have tutors, but no facility. So I'm going to invite them to offer tutoring and deliver their curriculum on site a couple days a week in my program's community room and offer this service to my families with school-aged children. That room was sitting empty during that time anyways, and I'm already paying the utilities. It potentially solves the problem of kids not having anything to do, and it's an added benefit that the residents are able to sometimes maybe work extra shifts because their kids are going to be supervised. In fact, a greater percentage of people are paying rent on time than they were before the program started. I'm even thinking about recruiting some of the residents to volunteer to distribute after school meals to the kids in the program. Now, a written memorandum of understanding, or what's called often an MOU, might be created in this case. This provides both parties with a schedule of when the nonprofit provides tutors, describes the requirements of the space, and provides a list of details that's needed to communicate accordingly to the residents. However, while this joint project is beneficial to my operations, it is not critical to the success or failure of the transitional living program. Moving across a little bit more, we have collaboration. We're going to continue kind of let's let's see with this housing program example, right? So let's say that I've learned that by offering regular tutoring, I can apply for some grants or perhaps I'm going to start marketing after school tutoring as a benefit of my housing program. I now have a new scope of work that includes activities or strategies beyond what I can offer on my own. That new scope is an after school program for youth in transitional housing. At this point, if the tutoring program goes away, my program is missing something. In this case, an MOU or a letter of commitment will be important and should define the exact space that's being provided to the nonprofit and what the in-kind value of that space is worth. And maybe it even defines the time frame from which the agreement will be in place before it's renewed again or maybe even ended. The MOU will also define the service the nonprofit will offer and the dose and duration of the service of the service that's being offered. Sometimes MOUs can think of them be like a safety measure if either partner is concerned that the other partner might forget what they've committed to. I think something in writing feels safe. Again, in cooperation, resources are being shared. If the tutor stops showing up, it's inconvenient and disappointing. However, as you move towards where the program depends upon each partner doing their unique part to create a joint scope, such as in a collaboration, one partner not coming through means the program is not the program. MOUs offer protection as well. It's a contract. It's signed by someone who is authorized to commit to the contract. Now let's consider another example of collaboration, right? Let's say stakeholder one is a health center that serves a very high population of low income residents that are uninsured and underinsured. Stakeholder one has an electronic health record. Stakeholder two is an agency with an evidence-based program for lifestyle intervention that addresses chronic disease, but it's not yet had to be concerned with HIPAA compliance issues and hasn't ever used an EHR before. If these two entities decide to collaborate, stakeholder two is going to have to make an investment in software and legal concerns, frankly, surrounding compliance. But once they, once they do, stakeholder two can actually accept referrals through the EHR and likely grow the number of health partners that are providing referrals. But they're a little nervous 
and it's going to be an ongoing expense, but the resulting new capacity and potential outcomes are likely to be a game changer, even beyond this initial collaboration. Now, the level of partnership that extends beyond the chart that I was showing you to um, kind of to the right is something called collective impact. This typically means that the work of the collective partnership is focused on a new agenda or a scope that is that is not being or cannot be delivered by any one entity on its own. So this slide uh, lists some characteristics of collective impact partnerships. Uh, for example, stakeholders may establish new organizational documents, maybe a mission statement, bylaws, a decision-making protocol, and, or even a board of directors around this new scope. Coalitions are an example of collective, a co collective, collective impact. Coalitions are formed between stakeholders, and they may articulate rules to kind of guide or offer parameters for how the involved group will work together. These new documents also define the why of the collective work and create a culture of trust and frankly appreciation for iteration as a strategy for moving the group forward toward collective goals. Now, another key element of collective impact is that community members and representatives of the target population are equal stakeholders in the process and that the process is conducted maybe with an equity lens. The Collective Impact Forum is a great resource for anyone interested in learning more about collective impact and implementing principles of practice. And we've put that link for you in the chat. The National Council of Nonprofits also has tools and resources about collective impact available. While the joint scope of work, the collective lives outside any unique stakeholder's individual scope of service, one stakeholder might assume the role of what's called the backbone. This means they assume some of the infrastructure responsibilities needed for the scope, especially in the early stages before any joint products are created. Now, the difference between the columns in the previous slide has to do with the extent to which the partners invest trust, time, and what's called turf or resources resources, right? The three T's. These are priceless assets in the nonprofit world. Obviously, the more complex the relationship and the more skin in the game each organization commits to leveraging will translate to more resources that are required. How many times have you personally said, or maybe at least felt, that it would just be easier to do it yourself? Those are questions that you really have to battle sometimes when you think about your investment of time, trust, and resources. So perhaps an important question to ask yourself before you go looking for a partner is whether you're ready to be a good partner. Do you and other key staff in your organization consider partnerships to be valued? Or do you really call them a necessary evil? Or nuance, uh, nuisance, or maybe you're on the fence, you're not quite sure yet. I know that as a grant professional, there are absolutely days that I wish the organizations I work with would put more thought into their partnerships before we jumped into a grant proposal with them. And if I had to list what makes a great partner in a grant, it would include an organization who is on time to meetings, um, an organization full of ideas, but not forceful about making sure their ideas are the ones adopted for a project, and I'd like them to be responsive via email or phone calls, have easy access to clean data, and frankly, not be afraid to share it. <laughs> Again, they're willing to invest time in the project, trust us with their ideas and data, and bring resources to the table. So as you think about asking people to participate in a project for a federal grant proposal, I would recommend that you think about what your organization is willing to, to do and to provide for time, trust, and turf, again, or resources. Now, here are some common reasons that organizations choose not to partner. I'm sure you've heard many of them before. One, partners don't follow through with their commitments. They're like, oh, well, I don't want to be held accountable for noncompliance if they don't follow through with their commitment. And 
I don't want to have to run anything through legal, like an MOU or a letter of commitment. That takes too much time. Or, hey, we need all that grant money ourselves. We don't, we don't want to have to give any to a partner. There's, there isn't enough money in the budget as it is. There is truth to many of these statements, especially if a decision maker has had a bad experience. But let's also take a look about why organizations want to partner to access more money, like in grants or cooperative agreements, as an opportunity to get more clients through referrals or service agreements, to add a service or an activity that's not available but may be offered by another agency, or to access resources like volunteers, evaluation capacity, et cetera. These are all valid reasons to partner. So I encourage you to take a look and think about the, the agency or agencies you work for and kind of where they fall along this continuum. So before I move on to program design, does anybody have any questions about um, identifying partnerships and kind of reaching out to build those types of, of relationships? All right, well, I just want to put a reminder out there if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the question section or in the chat. Now, just like we have talked about the questions of time, trust, and turf, we need to ask about how you're going to involve partnerships in the design and development process of a federal grant. Some would say that, well, it depends on whether the partnership is required by the grant or not. But I'd like to push back on that a little bit and ask a few deeper questions about your organization's culture. Are you trying to keep partners out of the program design and development of the application so as to control the project yourself? If so, is this because you feel like you can maybe make decisions more quickly if they don't have to be debated by committee? Or are you worried that the other organizations are going to try and wrestle control of the grant from you? Or are you nervous that your organization won't get as much money out of the grant as you want if you aren't the one controlling the design and development process. The reality is, is that I understand that often organizations don't trust each other, frankly, because of the way fundraising is kind of set up within a community. Like we're all competing against each other for local dollars. But I also understand that with federal government, often providing only four to six weeks between when a grant is offered and when it's due, it can feel like you don't have time to design a project by committee and get a quality proposal written and out the door. But I also want you to stop and think about maybe whether there's an ethical question you should ask yourself, starting with what's the intent of the funder? Now, as a grant professional who writes many federal grants, I've written some very large and complex grants. One of my first questions in these grant meetings are who are the partners and are they all being included in the grant planning and design meetings? And while this might seem like an odd question to some of you, you might think, well, of course, but I've actually written grants in which I personally have never spoken to any of the project partners. It made me extremely uncomfortable, especially when grants require specific groups of people to be partners. For example, there are several Department of Justice grants which require the applicant to partner with law enforcement, which, you know, no doubt seems pretty reasonable for a Department of Justice grant, right? Now, I've written several of these types of grants, one in which education entities were the applicants and were seeking to address school violence, bullying, suicide, or even at the higher education level, something like sexual assault. All of these grants required a partnership with law enforcement. In fact, in some of the higher education grants, there was a specific MOU, again, a memorandum of understanding that was to be used and a detailed description of what each partner would bring to the project had to be written in it. Challenge was, I've worked with educational institutions in which they didn't actually include the law enforcement partner in the grant as a true partner. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in essence, they talked with someone they knew at the, the local police station who was able to take the MOU to the chief of police to sign. The police were never actually involved with the proposal development, and they weren't really involved in the program design either. Now, sometimes this works 
in really small rural communities because everyone knows everyone and the schools work hand in hand with law enforcement every day. But when I write for an institution, to buy, an institution for higher education and they never bring a member of law enforcement to the weekly project design meetings, and then they have difficulty getting the required data for the needs section and the signature for the MOU, I'm not surprised. They don't feel like they've been bought into the project. There's a disconnect between what the expectations are of each partner in terms of time, trust, and turf. Perhaps they have a high trust relationship and the police just don't have the time to bring the resources the proposal needs to be successful. On the other hand, perhaps the police don't feel bought into the proposal because they feel like the applicant's just using them to get funding for themselves. And the police aren't going to see any benefit, either in terms of financial or outcomes in the community, especially if the applicant doesn't share information on what the grant is truly trying to accomplish in the community. As I mentioned earlier, it's vital that partnerships consider in a federal grant application what the funder is trying to, to accomplish with their RFP. And the Department of Justice in many of these grants is trying to use its financial influence to build relationships between, in this particular case, education and the schools in healthy and supportive ways. So when I see a person or an organization trying to avoid bringing a partner to the table, I feel like it's my ethical duty to bring up the question, why? Why are the partners not at the table when the project and the proposal are being developed? Ideally, the full team of partners will spend time talking about what's called the data methodology involved in any joint scope of work and include the program team, the data folks, and any quality control folks from all the relevant partners. Even if it's not required, Think about each step of the methodology and talk through it. What data will be generated from the project? What's the source? How will it be collected? Are you gonna have surveys, checklists, interviews? Who will put the collected data where? Who will do what with what collected data? Who will do what with the analyzed data? Think about how the activity would form a timeline section, a roles and responsibilities chart, a work plan, a logic model, and even a budget. All these things take time and effort, right? Can you imagine the time, trust, and turf issues that could surface if this exercise is just glossed over by one or multiple stakeholders? So as you pursue a federal grant proposal, make sure there's a clear understanding between the partners about what their responsibility is toward project design. This may include a time commitment for attending meetings, tracking down information between meetings, either data or research elements of the program design, or answering questions sent via email. Build on your trust to invest time in developing a quality program design so that everyone in the team will see financial resources from the project. So in the same way, there needs to be an understanding from the beginning about the commitment toward project design, and the same is true for the grant proposal creation. But the exact involvement each partner could have in the actual proposal creation may depend on the RFP, the proposed program or project, and the partners. So here are some questions to consider. One, who will serve as the lead applicant? While they do not necessarily have to be the partner that prepares the proposal, Perhaps they're the lead applicant because they have more resources, relationships, or stake in the project than other partners involved. Or perhaps they have the most knowledge and information about the proposed program or project. So it makes sense that they would take on the bulk of the proposal preparation work. They also might have the experience preparing and managing federal grants and be willing to help facilitate this for smaller organizations in their community. In fact, I wish more communities had organizations like this, but frankly, it can be a lot of work. The second question, do any of the partners have an in-house grant writer or maybe a contracted grant consultant? This is a significant resource that should be heavily weighed in the decision um, of which partner should prepare the proposal. A grant professional, even if they're not employed by the lead applicant, can lend expertise 
in grant partnerships and facilitate gathering the necessary application components and information to build a strong proposal. If there are multiple people available to help create sections of the proposal, you might want to make sure you're also investing the time into voicing the proposal at the end. That's a person who ensures that it sounds like it was written by one person and not uh, people from different perspectives. You want to present the overall timeline and then ask the how this timeline meets the needs of the individual organizations. For example, let's say one of the partners is a school. Are you asking them to participate in planning meetings during spring break or finals? If you need original signatures from authorized signers from, let's say, I don't know, 15 different agencies, are you asking their availability before you just assume that they're all going to be at your beck and call the day before the deadline? As the grant professional, you need to be acting with grace and building as much capital as you can along the way with your partners, especially should you actually need to expend some of that due to any last minute, let's call them blips in the collaborative writing process. And I can, and I absolutely will tell you, those blips will occur. <laughs> Often people think about things like letters of support or commitment about eh, halfway through a project, but then don't create the letters until even one or two weeks before the grant is due. I think it's important to really think about the level of partnership um, from the continuum that we talked about earlier. Um, what kind of information are we sharing with organizations from whom we're re we are requesting letters? Are we explaining to them what we plan to do with the project? I think if we did this, we'd get, frankly, much better letters of support or commitment. But that also points to the question of how much time are we giving people to provide us with a letter of support? And are we giving them with enough information about the project to determine whether this is a really important or relevant for them to have their support? And my third question is, think about what other resources do each of the partners have? Is one partner particularly well connected throughout the proposed geographic area to be served or um, involved in maybe key organizations that would benefit from the project? Perhaps that partner could be in charge of gathering the letters of support. Does another partner have a finance person who's absolutely experienced at, with managing federal grant funding or filling out all the forms? That partner could be in charge of developing the budget. And last, what type of information will you need to prepare a competitive proposal? Even if one organization has the grant professional who's writing the proposal, that doesn't mean that the other organizations just sit back and let it happen. The writer needs the project partners to serve as subject matter experts. They are in the project for a reason. A quality grant professional should ensure that each partner contributes actual content toward the proposal. Now, initially, the grant professional can use the RFP to create an outline or a rubric to share with all the proposed partners. This will serve as a tool to aid in answering the questions. Who will be contributing to which section? It might be obvious, like the marketing consultant partner should uh, take the commercialization section, the research scientist should take the technical objective section. But it also might be that the partners have ind might independently complete their own market research, or they have some kind of useful data or information or background or insight to contribute to a variety of sections. So if you send the rubric or outline to all the partners and ask them to make some initial notes throughout, this is going to help uncover, let's call them less obvious insights and resources. But then once you've received all those notes, your responsibility is to kind of compile them and check for inconsistencies and frankly conflicting information. These are the types of things that should be discussed at meetings, not passing out lists of data to be collected. That can be done via email. I'm a huge fan of not having a meeting for meeting sake and having an email do the things that an email can do. But it is important to make sure that all partners are on the same page throughout the development process especially if a partner has to be gone from a meeting. So then schedule a meeting or a call to walk through a high-level overview of the, each of the sections. 
outline the key points to be made and any identified inconsistencies that need to be addressed. If there are multiple writers, after the feedback and discussion, partners can kind of be assigned to different sections to write or maybe just be on deck for questions and to review specific narrative components. Then, once a solid draft of the proposal is created, it's critical to have all partners review it. You want to distribute the proposal materials early to avoid chasing down partners at the last minute to get their feedback, uh, and then only you know, to find that they've identified a major issue or discrepancy in the narrative. Too often, people wait until the grant is polished before sharing it. Try to create, let's call them different layers or levels of review, and then explain exactly what you want them to look for when reading it each time. Think about like how many drafts and, and when each person will look at it. Who within each partner organization is, it reviews the proposal after it's been drafted. If you're writing about a partner in the community, are you letting them read what you write about them? Do they get a say in what you write about them? Do they get veto power? Think about how you're going to handle contradictory edits. Um, what if someone from your agency wants to make changes to content you've written about a partner, but the information came from the partner? What happens if the partner doesn't like what you have written, but it's what your executive director told you to write about the partner? What do you do? The writer can add comments throughout the narrative to ensure specific partners pay attention to the questions that are most pertinent to them. Um, and if you've got a discrepancy, you can create it in a comment, um, and that allows you to kind of step back and let the partners hash it out, for example. Um, you can ask them to track their changes so you can easily identify what they've edited, added, or removed. This is honestly like one of the my uh, least favorite aspects of Google Docs because I have to work so hard to figure out what people have changed. Um, and then once you address and incorporate all the partner feedback, send out a final compiled draft for their review. This discussion is mostly related to the proposal narrative component, but it's also important, ships, important in partnerships that everyone's in agreement about the budget as well. Now, before I jump into the budget, does anybody have any questions about design or about um, the um, development of the proposal itself? I think most of the questions I've been able to answer along the way. Okay, so today we have seen uh, how different partners have different levels of involvement in the program design and grant proposal creation. Once your collaborative team has completed the program design and has delegated the proposal writing responsibilities, the big question is, frankly, the elephant in the room, if you will, is who gets the money? And the answer is, well, it depends. Financial compensation in a budget is, in my opinion, one of the most challenging parts of any grant. As a person who's been writing grants for nigh on 20 years now, frankly, Federal grant money can make some of the nicest people in the, in the world be rude and selfish, like a two-year-old who says, no, mine. As we think about the financial compensation for the various partners in grant budgets, it is important to keep the level of commitment in mind. So here are kind of some qualifying guidelines, right? Perhaps when, when you read the notice of funding opportunity or the request for proposal, um, it might dictate the funding percentages that must be allocated to specific activities. So for example, if a partner organization other than the lead applicant provides the required activity, the level of funding proposed to fulfill the activity requirement will be allocated to the appropriate funding source. Second, Maybe that RFP may limit the amount of grant funding any one collaborative partner may receive, regardless of the distribution of the required and proposed activities. And third, in some cases, the total amount of project funding may increase for proposals that, dis that demonstrate a collaboration between two or more eligible partners. For example, if an organization 
um, is eligible and fully qualified to meet the required performance on its own, it may only be eligible to request the maximum grant award of, let's say, a million dollars over five years. But if the same organization partners with one or more likely eligible and qualified institutions, the total request amount may increase. Um, I've seen this with the DOJ, the, the grant that I was talking about earlier, where they were dealing with sexual assault. When you have a consortium of organizations, you can ask for an increased amount. Another one um, is if that four-year university partners with a community college. The National Science Foundation has a scholarships for um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics um, grant that they can get uh, additional um, dollars in, in those um, in those scholarship dollars, but it has to be a very clear partnership, not just a, oh, we're going to partner with the local community college. It's got to be very, very specific. So let's dive into kind of the big question here. Who decides how much each partner gets? So one, I recommend that you start by looking at your planning documents and your program design logic model. Which activities will require grant funds to accomplish? How are the activities directly aligned to the proposed objectives? Which partner or partners will contribute resources to accomplish the activity and meet the objective? As you begin to answer these questions, the framework for the project budget should naturally start to develop. So what I have here on this slide is a solar energy example, right? And let's say that the notice of funding award or notice of funding opportunity dictates that the county must be the lead applicant. Accordingly, let's say Orange County has the personnel and capacity to launch an education or awareness campaign via social media, TV or radio, and printed mailers, and a process rebate checks to homeowners. The county estimates it will need approximately eh, 16,000 or so, which is about 17% of the total request amount to pay existing personnel to accomplish these activities. However, the county needs to identify a mailing house for the printed mailer this would be considered a vendor contract. Now the mailing house is considered a vendor contract because it provides a standard service with standard rates on the open market. Post award, the county would need to follow its purchasing and procurement policies and procedures to contract with the mailing house as a vendor. This vendor contract would be just a single line item in the county's budget. In our example though, the project design team decided to enter into a partnership with solar for You, a for-profit company qualified to determine residential solar eligibility, provide configuration options, and draft initial energy savings estimates for interested homeowners. This would be considered a sub-award. solar for You has specific technical expertise required to accomplish the activity and successfully meet the objective. And let's say an estimated 22,000 and change, or about 24% of the total budget request, is going to be allocated to Solar for You. As a sub award, Solar for You should provide the county with a memorandum of understanding or some kind of letter of commitment to go into that application package as directed by the funder's guidelines. Additionally, as a sub award, Solar for You should be prepared to supply the county with its proposed budget, activities, and a description of its qualifications to perform the activities. The federal funding opportunity dictates that 50% of the requested grant funds be allocated to participant support. In this case, basically to incentivize homeowners in Orange County to install solar panels. The project design team allocates, let's say $50,000 of the direct costs to homeowner rebates. Finally, the project design team determined that the project would benefit from an external evaluator to assist the county with data collection, formative and summative evaluation, and reporting requirements. Unless otherwise specified, a good rule of thumb is to budget approximately 10% of the direct costs for external evaluation services. Now, typically, an external evaluator is selected according to the lead applicant's purchasing and procurement procedures in advance of proposal submission. This ensures the applicant is able to include a reasonable budget allocation to the evaluation activities, as well as the qualifications and experience of the evaluator. So when preparing a federal grant proposal, it's a good idea to qualify two or three evaluators and then make your selection based on the relevant experience, qualifications and expertise, service delivery, and price. 
and and I absolutely deal with a lot of organizations who are like, whoa, we do not have the time to go through our bid process to have an evaluator. So some organizations go through an extensive bid process to have a pool of evaluators that they can then choose from um, in, a, in a much shorter uh, time frame. So that's a, something to keep in mind. So when developing the grant proposal budget, you want to think about the fact that, that the more detailed it is, the better. When preparing the budget for a federal grant application with one or more partners, keep in mind that the level of detail required, required by that funding agency. Generally speaking, the lead applicant will prepare a comprehensive budget with summary line items for something called contractual services to be completed by named partners and subawards. In our example, Orange County would prepare a budget request totaling 105,000 with lines for 22,5 and 10,000 in the contractual category for solar for you and the evaluator respectively. In the comprehensive budget narrative, Orange County would describe the nature of the contractual relationship as a subaward or a contracted service and would further provide details about the type of services to be provided by each partners. Now, in some agencies, this level of detail is sufficient. Others want to see a full independent budget and, uh, and budget narrative submitted from each subaward as part of the application package. In either case, an MOU or a letter of commitment outlining each partner's contributions to the project should be prepared and kept on file at a minimum by the lead applicant if it's not submitted with the grant proposal. The budget narrative is a great resource when developing your federal grant proposal with partners, subawards, participants, and vendors. Space is sometimes limited within the proposal narrative itself, so the budget narrative often gives you the opportunity to provide additional details to explain the necessity of the budget items. Now, always keep in mind that the budget narrative should adequately describe how each proposed expense is justifiable allocable and reasonable. Justifiable supports one or more required proposed objectives. Allocable is, means it's an allowed type of expenditure based on the funding agency's specific guidelines and based upon the relevant cost principles outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations, often called CFR, and it's reasonable. The cost is in line with similar costs typically paid by the organization, and it's in line with what a reasonable person would expect to pay. Now, in the event that a federal funding agency does not require the standalone subaward budget, best practices di dictate that a detailed line item budget uh, should be prepared by the subaward partner. This will be beneficial um, for reporting and monitoring purposes post-award. Now, there are many ways for partners to demonstrate commitment to a grant project, both financially and non-financially. From a financial perspective, funders may require the applicant or the consortium of partners to demonstrate non-federal financial contributions to the proposed project. In some cases, cash from non-federal sources committed at a prescribed ratio to federal funds requested is required. This is referred to as cash match. In some cases, it's expected that the proposed program will generate revenue, which should be returned back to the program, thus reducing the overall amount of federal funding needed to successfully meet the objectives. In other cases, the federal funding agency makes allowances for in-kind contributions, which can be cash or donated goods or services for the benefit of the project. Regardless of the type of financial contribution required, or recommended by the funding agency, it is reasonable to expect that subaward partners would contribute financially proportionately to the amount of federal grant funds received. Now for a cash match, you want to look for common matches like one to one, one to two, or one to three, which means that for every one dollar of federal funds awarded, the applicant or the consortium of applicants must provide $1, $2, or $3 respectively in non-federal funds. The consortium of partners may consider securing the non-federal cash match through traditional fundraising strategies or by expending operational cash resources before requesting reimbursement from the federal award. Additionally, if indirect costs are allowed, 
you may be able to request less indirect costs than allowed and designate the balance of the indirect costs toward the required cash, cash match. You do really do recommend that you uh, like talk to the federal agency program officer if this is allowed though prior to submission to your application package if you want to use that strategy. Um, the other thing is that other funding streams, state, local grants, um, you don't want to commingle funds and you want to avoid supplanting existing revenue streams with federal funds and you don't want to count pass-through funds uh, which is federal to state to organization toward your cash match. Level of effort or maintenance effort, if a cash match is required, the federal agency will require documentation proving the consortium of partners has maintained or met the required level of effort. Auditors are going to look for this documentation as part of your schedule of expenditure of federal awards, the CIFA, and in your budget reconciliation records. The third one is in-kind contributions. Collaborating with partners on a grant-funded project often has its advantages, one of which may be the ability for partners to kind of leverage in-kind or non-monetized resources to the project. For example, some of the grant activities may take place at a partner's facility. So instead of charging the cost of facility rental or equipment use to the grant, the partner offers the use of the facility free of charge representing an in-kind contribution for the benefit of the project. Now, some federal agencies, like the National Science Foundation, have a required facilities equipment and resources attachment where the consortium of partners can document the respective in-kind contributions. If this type of attachment is not available, describing each, other's, each, each partner's in-kind resources in an MOU or a letter of commitment, or maybe even in the budget narrative, is the best strategy. Other types of in-kind contributions that might be appropriate to consider would be referral resources. Are there key organizations that refer program participants to you or evaluation resources? Some larger organizations such as medical systems or universities already have personnel skilled in evaluation on staff that can contribute their time in, por in portion or in full to the project. And the last one is program revenue. Depending on the structure of your project, it may generate revenue. If that's the case, you should make every effort to budget the estimated amount of program revenue and then decrease your federal request by that amount. Like the cash match, program revenue will be audited, so keep meticulous records. Now, if you noticed earlier, our example had a total requested amount of 105,000. There was an extra 5,000 in there considered indirect cost, which is eligible to be recovered by the awardee. So in our example, Orange County opted to use what's called the 10% de minimis modified total direct cost as a basis for its calculation. There are numerous federal guidelines on the recovery of indirect costs, and we won't go into that level of detail today. But the takeaway here ties back to our initial question, who gets the money? And again, the answer is, it depends. So there are multiple strategies to consider, all of which are valid. One. As the lead applicant, the county may recover the full amount of indirect cost awarded and use it for the county's operational budget as a contingency fund for the solar project or as a combination of both. If the subaward were uh, another nonprofit agent organization, the indirect cost could be divided proportionally between the partners. A word of caution here, if the subaward partner organization has its own federally negotiated indirect cost rate, the two partners have to agree on the indirect cost percentage allocated to the subaward. A thorough understanding of applicable regulations and guidelines would be useful here. Now, once the grant is awarded, the lead applicant and the subaward partners, of course, are anxious to start spending the grant award, but first things first, with federal awards, the lead applicant has the legal responsibility to ensure that it can certify the assurances, terms, and special conditions associated with the award. It has the policies and procedures in place to foster an environment of strong internal controls, ethical conduct, and generally accepted accounting principles. It has the capacity to monitor any and all sub-awards and hold those partners accountable to the same standards of internal control, conduct, and integrity. And the lead applicant has the policies and procedures in place to inform and implement the ongoing monitoring of all subawards. 
before you spend any money, best practice dictates that all partners solidify the MOUs, making any relevant updates based on change circumstances since the proposal was submitted. This is a good opportunity to review the comprehensive budget and the subaward budgets and to put policies and procedures in place governing the expenditure and reimbursement of grant funds, documenting cash matching, in-kind contributions, and program revenue. One strategy to consider is to have a monitoring and reporting benefits is the lead applicant to establish a policy whereby subawards may not draw down any grant funds without first submitting all relevant data, reports, and expenditures supporting the documentation. Policies and procedures should be in place, um, should include purchasing and procurement in alignment with federal regulations, uh, drawdown and reimbursement practices, segregation of grant funds within the accounting system to prevent co-mingling and supplanting and to facilitate accurate reporting, time and effort reporting of all personnel dedicated to the grant funded project, and identifying and reporting financial conflict of interest. Now, when working within a consortium of partners, each partner must recognize and adhere to their legal responsibilities regarding monitoring and evaluation. And here I've shown you what are the responsibilities of a lead applicant and what the responsibilities are of a subaward. Although it may seem time consuming, repetitive, and even onerous, financial and programmatic monitoring and evaluation is for the benefit of the project, the project partners, and ultimately the people and community served by the project. Ultimately, organizations' infrastructures are strengthened. Strong organizations with demonstrated capacity to manage federal awards can earn more federal funding. Increased federal funding helps organizations act strategically within their communities to meet their mission, and as a result, communities thrive. So, what are the next steps that you can take to be prepared to apply for federal grants, which may be require or benefit from community partnerships? One, get to know the organizations in your community who provide similar services to different, to different populations and different services to similar populations. Meet with them at the leadership and direct service level. See if you can start to build understanding and trust over time. Try to find simple initial ways to support one another across the partnership continuum. Talk with leaders in each organization about what, what's currently challenging for them and where they want to grow. See if there's grant funding that maybe has been available in the past, which would benefit the partnership or consortium or agencies in the future. Have conversations internally about what you need and want in a partner. This may include your ideal partner and, and what are the kind of the minimum non-negotiables for you. This will help guide you before you're making decisions whether to apply, which frankly is enough stress for many organizations, much less consortium. Think about what resources you can bring to a federal grant proposal preparation process. What time and resources are available, both internal and external? For example, could you contribute to a pool of dollars to hire an external grant professional to help the partners? Then think about your own organization's comfort level with being an applicant versus being a subrecipient in a federal grant proposal. Do you have the policies and procedures to be the applicant? What about to monitor others? At what financial award level and time commitment level is it worth pursuing federal dollars? And last, but please not least, try to just think about what you want as an organization, but also consider about how your expertise can benefit your community. Partnerships aren't supposed to just be, well, what's in it for me? Instead, think about the equation, uh, the, the question, um, how will my participation in this grant address problems in the community, which my agency says it cares about in its mission statement? Okay, so I've gone a little bit over, but does anybody have any questions about all of that? <laughs> No questions? 
Okay. Well, I do thank you for joining us today as we examined how to create quality partnerships for federal grant applications. And I hope that you'll join us throughout the year. There will be another session uh, through the Office of Planning and Research um, September 28th when we're going to be talking about the elements of quality project design. If you're interested in a certificate for today's training for documentation of your attendance or continuing education credit, feel free, feel free to email me. If you're interested in additional federal grant training, you can check out our federal grant series. We also offer leveled grant training and training by topics such as our ethics and grant training series. To learn more about these trainings, please visit our website at www.acelgrantservices.com slash live dash trainings. Now there is a question um, that just came up. Will the slides from this presentation be available? And the answer is yes. It may be a couple of days. They'll, they'll go through um, the slides and make sure that they've all been um, made accessible uh, for various groups of people. Um, but then it will be available on the Office of Planning and Research's uh, website. Any other questions? All right, well, if you don't have any other questions, have a great day and good luck with all of your federal grants and with your partnerships that you'll be developing.